And that should like help it keep it tight because again, like it's just so fucking big. Like you <laughs> could do a three hour podcast on each issue. Right. Uh, when I was on JD's show for an episode talking about it, the edited version was over four hours and like the actual call was like six. Oh, wow. <laughs> and we still felt like we didn't cover everything. I, saying, so, I don't like have that kind of time. <laughs> no, 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 I, it's five minutes to midnight. I was not a father at the time. Yeah. I, that was not a thing that I could do at this point in my life. <laughs> Everyone, and welcome back to the Men of Steel podcast. I'm Case Aiken, and as always, I'm joined by my co host, J. Mike Falson. Hey, everybody, welcome back to the show. We are touching on a subject that we very early on in the show's run tipped our toes into a little bit, uh, but we, we were scared <laughs> of getting into the big one. But today, we are talking about the 1980 maxi series Watchmen. And for that conversation, we are joined by Doug Leaf. Hello. Hey, Doug. Welcome to the show. Hey, man. I'm really, really excited to be here. Uh, I'm, I'm looking forward into digging into this one. For people who aren't familiar with you, uh, quick explanation of your show, Nostalgia Marcanum. As the name suggests, it's a nostalgia-based podcast. So uh, we just sort of interview a guest about something that from their youth that means a whole lot to them and and why that thing resonates with them and why it still resonates today. Yeah. And I almost feel like we're doing an episode of your show here because uh, talking about Watchmen I don't think I've made any secret of it to anyone out there. Watchmen is like one of my favorite works of all time. What? It set up my love of comics on a level that I honestly was not prepared for when I first encountered it and has continued to shape my approach to comic books in general and my love of the creative team. It's exciting to talk about it here. I'm going to note that I have spent a lot of time talking about this comic on various things. And so if people want that like giant four hour conversation about Watchmen, you should go check out the episode of JD Martin's show comics quest that I was on <laughs> where we went really deep into that one. Today, we're going to try to keep it a little bit more focused to the, the men of steel of it all and have it be <laughs> somewhat, somewhat more focused on like, how are they playing with the Superman archetype? What does this do for comics in general for, and how that impacts Superman, things like that, as opposed to deep dives into the comedian or Rorschach or any of the things that are like, kind of like getting real far out there. So Watchmen for me was the third trade paperback I ever had. The first one was this little uh, digest sized version of Batman, the untold tales, I think it was called, which was like an origin story slash mystery slash like clip show of Batman stuff. And then the death and return of Superman. And then my uncle got Watchmen for me for Christmas, and I was way too young for it. This was like the, right, the first <laughs> printing of the trade. And like they were like, oh, yeah, this is a great comic. And I, I think I was like 10. <laughs> like I did not understand. I enjoyed some of it, but I did not appreciate a lot of it. But it became this work that I had that I would come back to time and time again and find something new, find something fun, find something creative. And then eventually really get into the larger storytelling stuff that was going on with it all. So it's been a huge part of my life. Doug, like you wanted to bring this comic to the show. What What's your experience with it? I was aware of it uh, because of its reputation, just because, you know, again, one of the biggest comics of all time. I'm not a huge comic book reader. I've kind of read a handful of trade paperbacks, you know, kind of the major ones. Like, I don't know, Batman the Long Halloween, right? And uh, I think I be first became aware of it because of the the V for Vendetta movie that kind of brought Alan Moore into my orbit. And then the trailer for the Zack Snyder movie was attached to the Dark Knight. And so I saw that and I was like, all right, well, I know this thing is a big deal. I know there's a movie coming. I should go read the thing before I see the movie. And I was floored by it. I thought it was just so smart. Um, and there was so much going on with it. It was so genre defining, but also subverting all of the tropes of the genre in so many different ways. And it just had a lot to say. I, I remember being aware it was on like Time's list of the hundred greatest works of literature of the 20th century or something, something like that. And yeah, it just it stuck with me ever since. I really like the Zack Snyder movie, uh, as a matter of fact. I actually, you know, I know it's a little bit divisive, but I personally really like it. And uh, we'll talk about it because it makes one major, major change to the story, which I think improves it a thousand percent, which is you know, the ending. Yeah, there's just so much to dig into, especially for your podcast, specifically focusing on Superman and kind of the relationship of these characters, Manhattan in particular, to that archetype. Yeah. J. Mike, 
It's been a while since we talked about Watchmen. <laughs> we talked about it when the show came out. What What's your association with the comic? Like, when did you first hear about it? When did you first read it? So, I think, like, right around the time the movie came out. Because everyone okay, was like, oh, yeah. my God, this movie's so amazing. And I was like, cool, whatever. Don't really care. <laughs> but I actually, like, sat down. Because uh, I think it was, I saw, I've never finished the entire movie. I always catch it in, like, parts here or there. I think the first time I actually tried to like get through a significant portion of the comics is when we were talking about it the first time. And I was like, okay, this is, this is, this is, this is pretty good. And then I tried to go back and watch the movie again. And I, I have beef with Zack Snyder, just in case Doug, you didn't know. <laughs> oh, but no, you're, you're, you're correct to have a beef with Zack Snyder. He's, he's done a lot of terrible stuff. This is a, to me, this is like the exception that proves the rule. Yeah, like this movie isn't what I thought it would be mainly because his name's on it. And I'm like, boo, this guy sucks. But then I watched it. I was like, all right, cool. It's not that bad. Like the parts I've seen, I'm like, oh, okay. He changed some things here or there. He changed the personalities from what I've seen. I'm like, all right, it's not that bad. Yeah. So I think that's a very, fairly common experience for, for the two of you. I, I had a lot of friends when the movie came out who for a long time and still to a degree, but the internet is more available to people and, and there's more just cultural knowledge of like, what's going on with comics and where to look. But at the time I, I had a lot of friends who wanted <laughs> as much of an explainer in a, a short time that I could give about it and thoughts about should they read the, the comic or not. And I remember showing a lot of people like where they could pick it up at the time I was living in New York. And I remember going to Midtown Comics, I think on three separate occasions with different friends and being like, yes, it's going to be in the trade paperback section here if you want to pick it up to read it. And at that point they had switched the printing to the yellow button zoomed in for the cover versus the one that was like the broken glass, which is the original printing that I had. So I know a lot of people who became familiar with, with the material because of the movie. And that's that's why you make the movie, right? So it can get to a broader audience and like have people be aware of a work of fiction and go back to the original source material if they like it and, you know, sort of experience all of those aspects. I think it's important when looking at Watchmen to look at the, the larger impact, but also look at the context for when it came out. So when Watchmen came out, I mean, here's the sort of like rundown, like nitty gritty of like the <laughs> of what it was, which was that Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons had been collaborating on various projects over the years. Alan Moore was an up and coming, like huge writer who had had major successes. So like you mentioned D V for Vendetta, Dave. Miracle Man was another huge one, which we spent a lot of time talking about. Swamp yeah. Thing was his big breakthrough in American comics at this point. And he had Dave Gibbons had collaborated on some stuff, including they did the uh, the annual for Superman, What to Get for the Man Who Has Everything or for the Man Who Has Everything, which we've talked about on this show. <laughs> so you can see that they're starting to like come together as these two creatives. Dave Gibbons has this very intricate art style. He has very realistic proportions to his work, and it's very well thought out shot composition and so forth, which works really well with Alan Moore's scripts, which if you've ever seen an Alan Moore script is the most detailed breakdown of every single angle, every single light, every single like background detail that you could imagine. Like they are dense works of art unto themselves. And so coming in this period, which is Right around when DC was trying to figure out how to restructure itself to compete with the rise in Marvel, like Marvel had had started to eat its lunch during the 60s, 70s and into the 80s. Now, they were having a hard time really bringing in new people because it had become this Byzantine structure of continuity and new properties had been brought on. And one of those new properties was the Charleston comics. So they had bought this other line that was funny to go back and like look at uh, a fairly conservative take on things. A lot of it was Steve Ditko's babies and Steve Ditko is a big like Ayn Rand, <laughs> just like objectivist kind of thinker. And so a lot of these characters were kind of designed that way. And Moore was like, well, I want to do like an Alan Moore take of a thing, which is take an existing work and then completely recontextualize everything and do something weird with it. And DC was like, well, no, we just bought, we just bought these guys. We can't break them just yet. <laughs> like, I know what you did to, Sm to Swamp Thing. I know what you did to Miracle Man, <laughs> but we, we can't do it just yet. So they were like, well, make a new concept. And so they were like, all right, well, we're going to file off the serial numbers. And they took the basic ideas of the characters and they're not all perfectly one-to-one, -one, but they, they do match up roughly to characters that existed in the Charleston line. And then sort of, built this world that is a conversation on comic book or really on superhero storytelling, but then with the added consequences of, first of all, the ripple effect of their actions and the impact of just what the real world is like to characters who had existed in the comics code. 
And so those two big elements combined within this decision to do way more with each issue and with the larger structure as a whole from a planning. And I guess the best way to say it is to take a lot of what had become sort of like film theory and apply it to comics the same way that Eisner had taken film theory of the day and applied it to the spirit to do things like we're going to have all these like repeated shots. We're going to have angles matter. We're going to have lighting matter. We're going to do all the things that like people can write essays about in any sort of like college thesis or whatever and apply that to a comic book and which had typically been perceived as being sort of for kids and a rushed out effort. And this is going to be here's this 12 issue maxi series with just so much attention to detail put into it, just ripping apart what had become the standard of the time. And then it was a hit. It was such a hit that DC was like, well, We don't want to pay the royalties that part of the contract included, which was if it was ever out of publication, the rights would revert back to the creators and we would lose out on any sort of money on this one. Uh, So they just kept on reprinting the (laughs) trade paperbacks. And so Watchmen, in one way, is the reason why the trade paperback boom of the 90s happened, which is a crazy part. And then it also influenced a lot of creators going into the 90s and beyond in terms of like what they could do with comics. It's a big part for what's considered like the image boom. It's a big part of the eventual dissolution of the Comics Code Authority, and it is hugely influential in terms of even just the interpretation of the characters. Like, despite the fact that they didn't want to use the Charleston characters, like, those Charleston characters are influenced by the popularity of their Watchmen analogs. Like, Rorschach has influenced The Question, and Dr. Manhattan has influenced Captain Adam, and Peacemaker has been influenced by The Comedian. So there's a lot of this, like, sort of ripple effect on this all. Here's a question for the two of you. When looking at Watchmen as a comic property specifically, what was the moment where it really hit you like, oh, they're doing like some very creative stuff with it? I think right away, the opening of it with the death of the comedian, it's extremely evocative in the way it's drawn. It's kind of brutal and it it brings you into the world in a great way of like letting you know like okay this is an alternate 1985 we've got this murder happening and there's so much attention to detail in every individual shot of that that it sets you up for this very adult world that it's going to bring you into and like you said a lot of comics were especially of you know that time were a lot of you know we for kids and here it's like, okay, we're going to get into a story where, like, politics matters, like, global politics matters. There's a rape at, like, the, the center of the story, right? There's all these things that would not be at home with, like, oh, man, Peter Parker lost his pizza delivery job. We're getting into this stuff that is really only for adults. And trying to use it not just to tell an adult story in terms of, like, the in- individual incident, but also the conversation it's happening with the world around it about, like, okay, who deserves power and who watches The Watchmen, right? The central question of it. So right away, all that stuff grabs you, and there's a sense of, like, authorial command from Alan Moore here. It's the kind of thing that's, like, Stanley Kubrick has this where it's just like you start watching a movie and like, I don't know what's going to happen. It might be weird. It might not follow convention, but I know the guy who's behind the wheel knows what he's doing. So I'm going to be along for this ride because he's got something planned here and I want to see how it unfolds. Just the opening investigation, like from the from the murder and like the way it like zooms up the cops interaction and then Rorschach's like silent investigation of the apartment and like figuring out like details, like figuring out that the comedian has like all the stuff hidden in the wardrobe, but based on like noticing that the wardrobe is way too shallow for like how big of a unit it is, but there, there's no <laughs> words drawn to it. Like I know people who had like read that scene and didn't process like, Oh, that's how we figured it out. He like measures how wide it is and it shows like the creativity of the character. But then like, it's a completely silent investigation sequence that, pieces together this whole thing and then lays this out for for the audience. And just with his little monologue as he's introducing this, where he talks about, you know, the people will look up and, you know, say, save us. And I'll whisper, no, (laughs) you know, this is our hero or or one of our our heroes we're first introduced to. And already it's like turning superhero stuff on its head was like, no, 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 you're supposed to want to save the huddled masses. And he's already telling him, you know, I I might be your hero, but I'm not going to do that. Yeah, I mean, he has the brutal scene where he goes to get information and he starts breaking fingers from the guy in the bar. And it's like, that's not what they did in comic books at this point. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, even for like, you know, someone like Batman who like, you know, knock a bunch of heads together. It's, you know, this is pretty brutal. 
but it's not just the brutality of his actions. It's the, you know, it's the harshness of his worldview outside of, you know, I don't know, maybe the Punisher and some other characters like that. It's very bleak and dark. And there's not any other characters that have a much sunnier worldview than he does, even amongst our heroes. Yeah. And I mean, and then through that first issue, we were introduced to all these characters and we see they're all in various states of there's this element of early Alan Moore stuff, which is weird to think about because now I'm realizing like, oh, he actually wasn't quite that old yet, where it's a lot about like the midlife crisis of characters. When we looked at Miracle Man, it was like, oh, wow, it's it hits very different when you're pushing 40 versus when (laughs) you're in like your teens. What are you talking about, Case? (laughs) <laughs> and, and like, well, and, and like, you know, characters like Dan Dryberg is like very much in that situation. And also Hollis Mason being someone who is completely past his prime, reflecting on the glory days of being a superhero. Like there's this nostalgia that they're experiencing and we're sort of witnessing, remembering how it all kind of fell apart. And we, the audience, because we don't know all the details, we're being filled in on how things used to be good in their eyes, but also still kind of broken and all those, like those little pieces of it. And that lead to this like sad, lonely middle-aged Dan Dryberg living by himself, but having a bat cave under his apartment. And, you know, Ozymandias being this like weird sort of out of touch, like business guy. And then Dr. Manhattan, who isn't even human anymore at this point, (laughs) like he's just so far removed from all that. And the first issue also does a great job of setting up, the weirder structure of this book, which is that every issue has supplemental material at the end of it all. Yeah. Right. The first couple chapters have the memoirs of Hollis Mason, which gives us a lot of information. And frankly, we'll have to talk a bit about that in a minute because we have to talk about some characters that we mostly know through the supplementals. The later issues also have like all this like extra layers of detail. Like they have like an advertising pitch for a toy line in there and they have like a Playboy <laughs> interview. And like there's so much more going on than just like here's the comic. And then the comic itself has so much artistry going into it. Within all of that stuff, you also have all of the Black Freighter, you know, supplementary material. Yeah. It's it's a lot. Mm-hmm. Yeah. J. Mike, for you, what was like a, a big like light bulb moment when you were reading this? So I was trying to compare what I remember from the movie to the book. And I was like, hey, you know, this Rorschach character looks very different from how like we see him in the comic book versus how we see him in the movie. <laughs> because like in, in the in the movie, they kind of like glorify a lot of what he did. But in the comics, he's more of like a he's more of a crazier anti hero ish type. Like, this is my version of justice and this is how I'm going to deal with everything type character, even though he could be very wrong about it. (laughs) But it's more of like, this is how I want my justice to be versus like how everyone else feels like it should be. Yeah. Rorschach, even in the first issue, before we find out more about him. He's the first character I ever really distinctly remember being dirty in a comic book. Yeah, because <laughs> like his clothes are, are worn. He, he's got stains all over them from all the various things, including blood. Yeah, but like you kind of feel for him because he comes from like a very like traumatized background. Like he had a lot of stuff going on when he was growing up. And you're like, OK, that can kind of like it shapes their version of morality from everything else. But then he kind of like takes it a step forward. <laughs> He does, but then again, like, out of all the characters, his moral compass kind of has the most clarity, which is at at odds with it sometimes. But, I mean, he's brutal, but he also, I think, has a fairly clear sense of, like, this is right and this is wrong, which is what ultimately leads to his death at the end, which is him saying, like, no, it's, you know, it doesn't matter that if we tell everybody it will undo this fragile piece because Mm -hmm. this is wrong. This is a terrible war crime that Ozymandias has committed. And I think that's why he's mostly our point of view character for the movie and this. Like, we kind of, you kind of tend to like him in spite of his brutality. Like, sometimes it's funny. You know, he has a lot of the best comedic lines in the thing. But you start going, like, as much as this guy is brutal, like, he doesn't make as many compromises. And he's, I think, easier to like because of that. You know, he, you just sort of want to go along for the ride with this gritty detective, despite his obvious (laughs) failings. It kind of reminds me of the line from Braveheart, which is like uncompromising men are easy to admire. <laughs> Obviously, the whole the, the white and black mask is like supposed to be representative of like there's just no blending between his perceptions of right and wrong. And, you know, when you get into it, like the, the actual story shows that he is actually more compromised than he thinks it he is. Mm-hmm. But it's in like specific moments or like he has mercy or he has elements of vengeance that go beyond the pale because all of these characters are all- – <laughs> 
are broken in some way Very beyond just, <laughs> you know beyond, beyond all of that but it's it's so interesting having this this character who again is like an archetype that you see in this kind of fiction all the time like the question it feels very much like the shadow you know it's like that kind of like pulp kind of detective character in a fedora busting down the doors and getting information and like i remember superman did that in his first book so <laughs> Right. Well, like that, that's what yeah. I'm saying, which is that like that kind of archetype even predates the sort of the, the super element of it all. And I think he pairs nicely with Dr. Manhattan, who is the more obvious Superman analog. Rorschach's kind of single minded view of morality is very humanistic. It's very grounded in the trauma he's suffered, the trauma he's witnessed. Right. The story about the girl who gets kidnapped and killed and fed to dogs versus Dr. Manhattan, who is so beyond detached from any of that. Those are your two polar opposites in a way. As like the comedian points out, he has that scene where comedians confronted by this Vietnamese woman who he's impregnated and he just shoots her. And Dr. Manhattan is like, Oh God, why'd you do that? And he basically says like, Hey, you could have turned the, the bullets into steam. You could have done anything you wanted to stop it. You just stood there because that's who Dr. Manhattan is. These, these people are all just, you know, collections of carbon and nitrogen and such to him. We're being filled in with so much detail about this while at the same time showing like all the, all the limitations of these characters. Yeah, we're, we're going to talk more about Dr. Manhattan. He, obviously, <laughs> we're going to spend some time talking about him. On my end with this series, like I said, I, I was given it way, 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 way too young and was <laughs> took, took a long time to even process some of like the horrors that happened within it because yeah. I just didn't have the lexicon to describe it all. But uh, for me, like it, it sort of created this scenario of like, well, I was super familiar with a lot of things from like the events, like every issue I knew very well. In a lot of ways, I took things for granted. So at some point I was reading about it and I saw a reference to the issue Fearful Symmetry. And realizing that, like, oh, my God, every single panel is mirrored from the entire issue, from the angles that the shots are from to the lighting situation for each one to, like, where the cop's side story appears within that. Every single part of that leading to the center point of the issue, which if you're looking at the individual issue and, and not the trade, you know, saddle stitch is going to be like that's where the staple is holding the whole thing together. And you get this V center frame with two bodies with reflections happening that all like perfectly mirror it for me that was like my real like holy crap what is this thing like they're they're doing so much and it's not just like oh there's a mirror shot in it like at one spot but like even down to like where the eyeline for the for the camera is supposed to be and i'm saying camera because it, i don't have a better way of describing it like 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 where we are looking at things and how they are lighting things like there's a flashing neon sign out outside of moloch's place that the rhythm of the flash matters to the rhythm of the panels that was the spot where i was like oh it's not just the character stuff. It's not just the world building stuff, like things like Dr. Manhattan's ending the Vietnam War and like the alternate history that we're seeing as a result of it. All, all those are really cool lore elements that like have been put in there. But it's like, oh, they're thinking about every part of every frame of this comic. Yeah, I mean, that level of detail is just something that, I, you know, again, I associate that with with more his I don't know if you call it mental illness, but like he's got this like, you know, insane kind of commitment to his stuff that leads to these levels of ambition that other writers just will not even they won't even conceive of this stuff, let alone try to pull it off. Just incredible stuff that they were working with. And then you get into some of the larger twists of the series, like the fact that the ending kind of the guy, guy wins, <laughs> <laughs> but then also it might be kind of undone because Referencing back to Rorschach and his uh, uncompromising nature, he sends the information that he has to an Alex Jones style rag. <laughs> it's a wild world that we're being presented. Let's move on to actually talking about the characters and how they sort of represent the Superman archetype. So Dr. Manhattan, we kind of want to talk about first because Dr. Manhattan is the, the most obvious thing. It's a, a giant blue super powered being, the only super powered being in this world. But it's so different from how you would normally think about that kind of element, you know, built on this idea of a guy leaping into action, saving the day. But here it's this truly divorced from reality, borderline omnipotent being that is in his own way trapped by his power into the, whatever cycle he's living out. His question is, he like straight up immortal from this point forward or is like he going to die eventually? <laughs> Uh, it's not stated in the book, but it's implied. Yeah, he is eternal now. Wasn't sure. Just wanted to ask. 
So many stories about Superman where they're trying to come up. What's a cool angle on Superman? It's always like, well, what if Superman was evil, right? He was we're, we're afraid he's going to use this power for to do wrong. And none of them will ever equal this, which is what if Superman not was not evil necessarily, but was sort of could not be trusted because his concerns are so far beyond ours, right? He's, his perspective on the world is so different. And so distorted now by his immense power, he talks a lot about, you know, he says, you know, he's just something like, you know, hey, a a dead body structurally is the same as a live one. It's the same collection of atoms and stuff. It's almost Lovecraftian, right? Like the way he views everyone, the way he views time is distorted. He can see his own past and future up to a certain point simultaneously at all times. He's also tied into this notion of relativity, which he you know, he said, like his father was a watchmaker. Then Einstein came along and discovered relativity, and that made his father want to basically throw watchmaking out the window because it sort of made time not irrelevant, essentially. But like that idea of like, yeah, time is a construct, and that's what sends young John Osterman on his journey to become a physicist. All of this stuff is swirling in the mix that basically says, yeah, this guy's outside of time. He's outside of morality. He's outside of the laws of physics and matter and energy and how that shapes his view of like, well, then why should he care about these little collections of carbon and nitrogen walking around and the different horrible things they do to each other? And you watch this guy, I mean, as we shuffle back and forth through the chronology, you watch him devolve towards this detachment that is, by design, terrifying. Yeah, we get such a good look into his way of thinking in the fourth issue, which is his whole viewpoint issue, which is told completely out of chronological order. Like, (laughs) but, but not just like it's cutting about, but his thought process is cutting about. Everything is being told from the perspective of like, well, in five seconds, this is going to happen. But then 10 years ago, this happened. Now we're down to two seconds. And now, you know, like moving so rapidly about this whole thing and seeing such a different perspective of it all. It's such a a weird way of expanding on what had already been presented as this like kind of cold, distant, super powerful being and really sort of getting you in that mindset. A long time ago, I I took a course on heroic literature, and uh, one of the big conversations was how you classify a hero based on their power of action. So you end up in the scenario where you have ironic heroes who have no power of action, and the the heroic quality to them is the fact that they are resisting even in spite of this all. You have low mimetic heroes who have, like, their own personal abilities to do things, which would be like a John McClane-type character who's, like, he's running around, but he, he can't. It's the limitations of the person in this scenario. A high mimetic hero is someone who is able to influence people around them. This is a leader. This is like Aragorn in in Lord of the Rings. You get into romantic heroes where we start delving into the mythological where they either can interact with beings far superior or are outside of the realm of what humans can do in some regards. So this is where we would have like a Hercules type. And then you get into the divine heroes. And usually that's where like they can do anything. But the interesting part about this is it's a wheel. And so like, Dr. Manhattan is, in a sense, a divine hero. He's a godlike being who can do all this stuff. But by virtue of being so aware of the framework of everything, he's aware of how atoms need to be positioned for them to work. And he's aware of how time is supposed to work. It kind of makes him trapped all the way back to being like an ironic character because he sees the flow of time and sees how it's limited. His ability to be heroic towards the end of the series is kind of by his power being reduced by Ozymandias interfering with his ability to see through time. And that allows him to sort of at least like feeling like he has his own impetus, like feeling like he has his own drive as opposed to just following the motions. Like, you know, we talked about the scene in Vietnam where he allows the pregnant woman to get shot. To him, it already happened. He's very deterministic. Yeah, he he just sort of sees like, well, if every if causality is just this set of electrons bumping into each other, you know, he can see every particle and what it's doing, then yeah, every outcome is just on this continuum of stuff. And that really messes with the idea of like uh, uh, the whole point of being a super, a Superman is of course to affect the outcome for the better, right? It's like, I'm going to stop right. the mugging from happening. And here it's like, well, whether Dr. Manhattan stops the mugging from happening or not, it's yeah, again, it's already happened. His influence is, on the one hand, it's godlike ultimate power, and yet he is, from his perspective, completely on rails. And so we end up with this character who 
I mean, he kind of allows people to sort of drive him anyway. Like he's, he, he never really makes a choice even before he becomes a super being. Like we find out his origins as being like a watchmaker's son and then being pushed into being a nuclear physicist. It's because his dad tells him to, you know, like he never is like really doing his like what he wants. And then when he becomes a super being, he allows the government just to tell him what to do. Like even his career, like fighting crime is because they're like, oh, yeah, well, you're a super being. So like go beat up the bad guys <laughs> and shit. And he does it. And it's kind of horrifying when he does. Like they, they have the shot of him when he's like at Moloch's nightclub or whatever. And he just is exploding a person because he's told like, well, yeah, no, like go go fight the bad guys. And it's just like, yeah, he, this, this God being just destroys everything around him. Utterly terrifying. That feeling of like, you can't stop him. He is truly unstoppable. And what if he makes a mistake? That's the thing. He's not actually infallible. He even says he's not omniscient, right? He doesn't know everything. So he could walk into a situation, believe someone to have committed a crime and vaporize the person incorrectly. (laughs) And that would be, there's no recourse for that. Just like with Rorschach in a way, it's like, it's the sense of like, well, justice and right and wrong is whatever they say it is. And what's interesting about it is that he's not omniscient, but he kind of is, but it's like in this like weird broken way of how his powers work. So he could be operating under false statements or like false information and find out later that they were false and know this in the past because he knows the future. But the way that his like the actions are supposed to play out (laughs) still play out that way. I think are we overthinking this? No, I mean, they want you to overthink this. You look at um, the whole thing with him and Silk Spectre on Mars, right? He brings her there so that she can convince him to reconnect with humanity and to care again, you know, to help the world avoid nuclear war, which she does. Uh, It's very hard to, I think it's still pretty hard to parse exactly what it is that helps him come to this realization. But bottom line is he could foresee the entire conversation. It already happened in his mind. So going through the motion of actually doing it, it's like, does he have to then fulfill this to, to ensure that the timeline doesn't get broken? Like it's, it's very interesting. The idea you have to convince somebody of an idea he already knows he's going to be convinced by. You can't even like square that with normal human thought processes. I think that there is a larger point being made about the nature of comics as well, or at least storytelling in this, in how he approaches this all. Manhattan describes time as being this multifaceted gym that people only look at one side at a time. But you could also see it from the perspective of like people looking at a comic book and knowing like when comic books come out, when when most stories come out, but especially when a comics code approved comic book comes out, you know, the good guys are going to win. Like, you know, that that's the end point that's going to occur. And that the question is, well, is there value in the telling? Is there a story that has to play out that will make you feel a certain way, even if you know that's how it's supposed to go? Like when you reread a book that you've already read, are you taking in, are you experiencing a thing and having an emotional response, despite the fact that there's no novelty to this all? And I I think that there's an element going on with that because like he's hurt when she tells him that she's sleeping with Dan Driver. That hurts him. He already said, when you tell me about it, two or three pages before that. So it's not that he's not aware of it. It's just that there's still this emotional response to acting out the scenes like that gets into this like larger kind of craziness of it all. But yeah, it, it hurts your brain to like really try to think about like to <laughs> think like, well, in the, f- you know, in the future, this thing's going to happen. And so like, it's going to make me feel that way when I, when I get to it, when you're actually in that perspective and it's so much easier to like be removed, to, to be a reader looking at it as opposed to the person like in it, <laughs> like to, as opposed to being like that meta character who can like skip to the end of the story and see how it all plays out. I mean, it's interesting that, you know, he does have emotions Despite this nonlinearity of time and despite the fact that he generally appears to not have emotions, he is very detached. I mean, there's no question that he is, but he still is, you know, obviously, you know, very upset by being accused of ever giving everyone cancer, including his ex, to the point where he, you know, just all of a sudden just shouts at them, you know, leave me alone and fucks off to Mars. That is uncharacteristic of him. And it shows like there is still some of his humanity left, even as it is, I guess, draining away. And like, again, to contrast that with with Superman, right? Superman is all about this alien who really, though, is, you know, he comes to Earth and he assimilates to be one of us. And here it's that in reverse, right? This is a human being more and more alienated by humanity. And I love that so much. I think and without this innovation of the, of this character, if all of the characters in Watchmen were just, you know, non-superpowered vigilantes, 
I think you would lose something. You need a character like this to kind of complete the metaphor that that Alan Moore is going for. Yeah, it kind of feels like a stone dropped into a pond that causes ripples and seeing how that changes much of it. Like the way the world plays out is so weird, but a lot of the ways that gets really weird is because he's there. Obviously, there's the political ramifications and like there's the whole doomsday clock thing going on here. Like this is obviously this was written during the Cold War as opposed to after the Cold War. But this is a world where the tensions have been ramped up so dramatically that everything feels like it's just about to end like that. You know, there's this huge nihilistic vibe that just permeates every scene. And it only gets to that point because Manhattan is there. That's one part of it. The technologies that allow for some of the stories to happen happen because they are studying the crazy shit that John is able to do. Like he's he has all these things that they can at the very least like look at and kind of approximate like they figure out teleportation. It doesn't work very well, but they you know <laughs> they have something to reference. Electric vehicles are everywhere because they have Fine cars. Yeah, because like there's all this work that he's able to sort of advance like even Rorschach's mask. Is that, is that, that explicitly him? a thing that allows? Yeah, it was one of my favorite details in there is that the fabric, this like sort of magical fabric that is his face, that fabric was made possible because of technology developed out of Dr. Manhattan's powers. I think that might be in one of the supplementary things. It's it's buried in there, but I remember noticing it when I read it. Like, oh, that's really clever. <laughs> Again, there's all these like crazy background details for it, like and, and little ways where characters kind of interact and overlap with each other and impact things. And then there's shit like how Manhattan's presence sort of makes that first wave of like wannabe heroes kind of like fall apart. Hollis Mason decides to retire. And then in retiring, he's talking to Osterman and Osterman's like, yep, everything's going to shift over to electric cars soon. And like this guy who's going to just become a mechanic is just like, oh, my entire my career is fucked. Damn it. Like it, it goes <laughs> off into like this like, like depressive spiral. You know, we see the the weirdness that impacts like Captain Metropolis and like Ozymandias and, mm-hmm. it, and all these characters who are influenced to think about the world in a different way because Dr. Manhattan is there. I mean, he represents what's possible, right? He, he is the guy that you look to and go like, okay, you know, all of these physics breakthroughs and stuff, right? Like we never would have in theory got there or would have gotten there much, much later without him providing these shortcuts. Like you inject all of this like uh, advanced technology before the populace is ready for it. Yeah. And this is where you get to a lot of the bad stuff that uh, Ozymandias is up to. So was the technology only limited to America or was it like far spreading? everywhere else around it. I imagine that it spreads beyond just American soil just because of the way I mean, commerce like, works. Like, like the point of view. Yeah, the point of view is like mainly American. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> we're not really – like elements like him being able to mass produce like the batteries. I imagine those got exported for profit because why wouldn't they? I imagine that there are certain like divides where like some things move more freely than others. There's still very – obviously the Cold War is in full swing. So there's got to be some yeah. east-west divide. But I don't know that the book goes into that much detail about how wide ranging the technological changes are. But it's implied that America would be ahead of the technology race because of Dr. Manhattan. We know that the world is different just in general. We know that because of the way Vietnam played out. We know that because of the ways like other other events play out, like even things like the fast food restaurants are different because of like which cultures sort of like made footholds into America versus other locations. The idea is that, like, once we start creating these, like, John Bar points where, like, the timeline is diverging, it spirals out way beyond. Like, it, while there are plenty of elements that are the same, like, there are new stories that happen later. Like, there's Kitty Genovese, which, man, that's a <laughs> that, that's a story that, like, this comic's operating under a perception of how things went that we know is very different now of the actual, like, logistics, such as people actually did call the cops, for example. So much kind of, like, spirals out in a way that, like, comics normally aren't allowed to do. And so, like, that's where it's really interesting and, like, why having just Dr. Manhattan is important also, because if you had more characters like that, I think the world would be impossible to predict. I mean, that's the one question that I I had with it, which is, like, there's not one other person who would say, I want to go through that machine. You know, this is a machine that makes gods. I think we have to just assume there's something kind of one in a million about this. But that is a question that they don't delve into is what if there were two Dr. Manhattans, you know, the. Uh, you know, how would that play out? But I think it would diminish the story. It's a fun mental exercise, but like the idea of there being, you know, one of these beings with this kind of power helps kind of focus everything. 
I imagine that the presentation of like how Dr. Manhattan thinks about things is the reason why he was able to go through that process and then reassemble himself. Like the watchmaker component, I think, is very important to it all, like him being able to see like, OK, it's not just that he understands the world. It's that he understands like how everything fits together to run. I couldn't do that. Like I, I have a basic idea of like what our skeleton looks like and like what all the veins and all our muscles look like. But like, I, I couldn't tell you from scratch, like atom by atom, build yourself together. Like, <laughs> like that requires a level of precision that like only a character who's established to have like just this complete meticulous control of that could allow. And I think that that sort of speaks more to his power is ultimately mental. Everything he does after he becomes Dr. Manhattan is based on moving electrons around, is based on changing the number of protons. He's changing the atomic structure of the things, and it requires a mind to do it. Like his teleportation abilities require his mind, because when we're able to approximate the technology, it still kills everyone. Like it doesn't work <laughs> because it needs like that that perfect ordered brain to put it all together. So like. John Osterman's a weird fucking dude before he becomes Dr. Manhattan, but he's also probably the only <laughs> weird fucking dude who could become Dr. Manhattan. Yeah, you're definitely right, because all the other heroes would either go batshit crazy. Could you imagine, like, a Rorschach Dr. Manhattan? <laughs> well, like, yeah, I, or a, I, I can't. Uh, Ozymandias because, well, Dr. Manhattan. It, and actually, that's the one I was going to say, which is so, like, Ozymandias, for example, is very smart, but he does not see how things piece together the same way. And I think that's no. also an element of what allows Dr. Manhattan to function, which is that he doesn't have agency the, the same way. Characters who have like bigger plans for things, who would try to push agendas of things, probably are losing sight of certain details in the process. I think this is a good time for us to move on to Ozymandias because this is talking about a character who is sort of presented as being a Superman in the framework of being a human taken to the extreme and who ultimately has big plans for rearranging the world. But he's missing details like the end, like while he kind of wins, he also kind of probably loses in the long run the last shot of the series is that he wasn't really paying attention to rorschach enough and that rorschach had collected a lot of information about the plan and had shipped it off to some crazy fucking right-wing rag which was probably going to fuck up a lot of those plans well obviously he's you know i mean it's in his name that he's going to fail i mean yeah uh, it's uh it's right there in the poem but to me, Ozymandias as a, a Superman figure, right? He wants to be. He literally catches a bullet at one point because it's reputed that he can do that. And we see him do it at the end. And he wants to reorder the world to make it a better place. But he looks at everything in this utilitarian way, right? I'm killing millions to save billions. And he's not totally wrong. But the worldview of Alan Moore and this world is kind of extremely cynical, about human nature to where it's like, even if he succeeds, even without Rorschach potentially screwing it up, it's like, yeah, okay, we've achieved peace through this belief in a, you know, a common antagonist, but for how long, how long can this really hold? Right. It's that arrogance. I think that is his undoing both in the short term and in the long term of this idea. This plan is, you are not going to fundamentally change human nature. And, and again, the, the most powerful being, right? Dr. Manhattan says, I can't do that. I can change air into gold or whatever, but I, I can't make people behave differently than what they are. We see that earlier during the, the Crime Busters failed meeting where he's like, well, with the right intelligence, I think superheroes could actually like go out there and, you know, shape society into a better future. And like the comedian's just like, that's a fucking joke, man. That's not going to happen. <laughs> I mean, he's way harsher about it all, but like you can't just have this arrogant, distant perspective of like, I'm going to move all the pieces around. It doesn't work. We see throughout the whole series that like Ozymandias, despite the fact that he is very capable, there's a lot of reason for him to have this level of hype, but he's still limited to being a person. When he confronts Manhattan at the end, like, yeah, no, Manhattan... He doesn't have a means of stopping him. The only thing he, he has is a means of explaining himself sufficiently there. But it's only a, a short term win as far as we can tell. You know, like you said, like how long could peace even last? Like those hostilities are going to flare up again. We'll talk a little bit about some of the spinoffs that have happened and like how they've tried to address it. But I don't think anyone would be surprised to hear that like a couple of years later, it's all back to square one. Maybe it was a de-escalation, but you're doing some really fucked up stuff and like there's going to be a knock on effect that you don't see. Consequences are kind of what this thing is about in a large way, right? Again, all of this watchmaker stuff, this stuff about time and 
every electron bouncing off every other electron makes causality kind of this inescapable linear thing. And so you combine that with the idea of like, well, humans are inherently flawed in this way. And like, yeah, the, the and that's what, exactly what Dr. Manhattan sees is like inevitably you get back to this point. And therefore, that's not how you make the world better in this giant macro way or, or with these enormous world paradigm shifting events. The way that you make the world better is the one he sees, which is, you know, oh, well, Silk Spectre and Night Owl can get together and have a nice life. You know, that it's it's these small scale victories that you can achieve that make the world a better place collectively. You're not just going to do it in one masterstroke. Why don't we talk about the plan of Ozymandias and some of the weirder pieces that are involved in it all? We probably should have put it like, we're just going to assume that you've read this book. (laughs) (laughs) So the squid plan. I don't know how well it makes sense to people if you haven't been reading the supplementary material, because there's a lot of like weird shit that happens in the back chapters. For example, we know that... They have this like whole collection of artists and writers that they bring to this island, sort of like shape out this like crazy monster that they're working on. The writer is the writer of the Black Freighter stories that we read all these like interviews about this, like kind of a prick who kind of feels like Alan Moore to a certain degree (laughs) with like his overly like precise like explanations of every single panel. We get elements of that. We get, you know, talk about some of the advancements in, in technology that leads to the teleportation. We get the bioengineers creating like all this crazy stuff, you know, and we see like a much cuter example with Babastus. But then we also see this like fucking monster that they're like <laughs> hinting at throughout. Meanwhile, we've got stuff like the assassin that he like hires to attack himself so that he is not in under suspicion. We've got stuff like yeah. the lock company that is constantly fixing Dan Dryberg's lock is the Gordian not lock company. And so it's owned by Ozymandias. Like he's keeping tabs on all the people around him very covertly in this whole process. Like it's a weird, long drawn out plan of like, oh, yeah, well, I, you know, I gave away all my wealth that my parents gave me. So that I could build myself up from 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 scratch, you know, minus the fact that he has all the connections and all the training and all all the stuff. And he rebuilds himself into being a, a billionaire and then secretly starts laying the foundation to create the greatest hoax ever and then misses like some minor details to him that like will ultimately cause it to all kind of fall apart. There's obviously merit to this idea of like, oh, well, I'll get the world to rally around a common enemy, so I'll just invent the common enemy by creating what appears to be an alien invasion. And then everyone will be, you know, working on together on the plan to defeat these aliens, you know, when, whenever the next one plans on showing up. Right. I think the movie's innovation of making the common enemy, Dr. Manhattan just squares that circle so much better. It's so much cleaner. He's already an alien in their midst that everyone's afraid of. It fits with his motivation to leave earth at the end. And it doesn't feel like it comes out of fucking nowhere the way it does in the book where it's like, surprise, giant alien brain squid. But the fundamental of the plan is ultimately the same in either version of the story. And like we sort of already been talking about, it's such a flawed plan because it's so temporary, even without Rorschach's mucking it up. But like the length that he's willing to go to for just on this one utilitarian concept, right? I'll kill a bunch of people and then everyone will be afraid and they won't have wars anymore. It's like the ultimate expression of this book's view of what power is and who gets to, right? He decide he makes that decision for everybody else on the planet. Yeah. No one else gets to be involved. And he kills all of the people, I believe, ultimately that were, that helped with it, right? To cover his tracks. Right, yeah, he, bo- he bombs the ship. And then like the scientists later on at his like last base that he poisons them all. Everyone who's attached, he kills in some way. It's about as dastardly a comic book villain plan as there's ever been. But in the name of peace. (laughs) Well, that's good. I mean, you need your villain to believe he's the good guy, right? That works much better. I mean, to the point that like all of the other uh, crime busters are like, except for Rorschach, are like, yeah, I guess now now that it's happened, I guess we we don't want to make the sacrifice for nothing. Right. So we'll go along with it. (laughs) Again, he does have a foundation of competency and accuracy to a degree like he is kind of right at the beginning at least that it does cause a ceasefire of sorts or like a a de-escalation of everything that's going on um (laughs) it's it's yeah it's it's a weird spot for them like do you sacrifice the things that have already happened in order to bring one person to justice if it's not going to bring those lives back 
<laughs> it's a weird moral conundrum. Like, where, like, what would you do in that circumstance? It's like trying to solve the trolley problem after it's happened. Right. <laughs> I've never thought about that. Solving the yeah, it's like yeah. this. It's a second <laughs> switch that causes the, the trolley to go backwards <laughs> over the the track that it didn't take. <laughs> so you kill everybody on both right, tracks. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind of. Ozymandias as a character, he's arrogant and flawed in those ways. But but, you know, he's also so he's so physically capable. He is so smart. He is so charming. It is that conversation of like, well, what can a person who is so charismatic and powerful within the realm of what a human can do, how much damage can they cause? It's a world leader who guides a nation to war. And even if it's under the auspice of of peace or of prosperity for his people or something like that, like ultimately there is an element of just like, you're, you're still just a person. You're not a god. You can't shape the world into a better place without bringing other people in on it. You're limited by the fact that like you don't have all the answers. Interesting contrast to Manhattan, right, which is basically who, who literally does have ultimate power or nearly ultimate power and says, yeah, I can't fundamentally change the world. I can't do that. And here you have mortal flesh and blood person Ozymandias saying, fuck you. Yes, I can. Or a little bit. <laughs> and he goes farther than everyone. Right. He goes, you know, he says because yeah. he's looking at all the other crime busters and uh, Minutemen and like, yeah, OK, these guys stop bank robberies. That's such small potatoes. Yes. Yeah. Like, none of them are, are taking aim at something bigger. It's interesting when you when you look at Ozymandias. So, as we mentioned, they're all kind of analogous to Charleston Comics characters. So, he's directly based on this character called Peter Cannon Thunderbolt, who himself was – Charleston had issues using a character. The Golden Age Daredevil is who he's based on. Basically took the same costume, removed the mask on the character, and made this new character to sort of, like, function in that space – and so it's like all, already this kind of like twisted notion of a hero that's been repurposed into one thing and then to another. And in this case, it's, uh, you know, it's Ozymandias, you know, which is the Greek name for Ramses. And like where we're, we're going into like kings and, and all this like weird stuff going on with, with a character who's supposed to be this regal figure, who's supposed to be all this stuff. But ultimately, he's still just another acrobatic superhero, like an acrobatic like guy in a suit is his shtick. They all are right. Everybody except Manhattan is just you know, well-conditioned human with spandex ultimately with greater or lesser access to gadgets. Why don't we move on to some of the other weird characters I wanted to like kind of talk about in terms of like the Superman archetype, you know, Ozymandias is about as far as a human can go. Dr. Manhattan's actually a super being, but I wanted to talk about two characters who we know mostly through the supplemental material. We like mostly through um, Hollis Mason's book. Although we do have some flashbacks with both of them more so the first than the second. Let's talk about Hooded Justice for a moment. So Hooded Justice is introduced to us as the first of these like vigilantes in this world and that he is set up to be this big, strong guy who just wore a mask and and beat up criminals. He functions in the world of the series as being like their Superman equivalent in terms of like the inspiration for it all. Hollis Mason in his book actually compares him to Superman from the comics because in the world of Watchmen, the comic Superman exists. It's just not popular because all these people are running around in, in suits just like Superman in the real world. And we're, you know, creepy dudes. I think like the pirate comics. Are the most right. Yeah. Comics. Pirates become more popular during during this era as a result and uh, continue to be the, the sort of the main thing, which is like a weird thing to think about, just like the world that you're in. Like, oh, yeah, we're going to the comic shop. It's like, oh, you're a big pirate fan. Uh, rah, rah. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Hood Justice, like <laughs> I like he's got the same kind of color scheme. He's got like a navy blue kind of outfit with red pants and a cape he's big and he's strong and he, the one big scene we have with him in the comic itself and not in the like the prose sections is him beating up the comedian and like he's clearly this like this mighty figure but we don't know much about him yeah we never even learn his real name there's like hint of who he might be but they don't actually tell you yeah there's a strong theory that they present in the supplemental material and then other stuff that has come out has like tried to present their own theories after the fact but he's he's always going to be under a degree of mystery to him. The one thing we really see him do is, like I said, he's not just confronting the comedian. He's preventing the comedian from assaulting Silk Spectre yeah, 1. Right. And it's like, OK, he's still pretty brutal. So it's not like this idealized version of a hero. But he is doing heroic things. Like we, we don't understand him to be quite as messed up in the head as uh, some of his uh, colleagues are. So there's an implication pretty heavily 
set up because we see letters between some of the characters that he and Captain Metropolis are homosexual lovers and that that's part of what's going on. Like with all the Golden Age characters, there's this vibe that there's a lot of like there's an element of kink and this element of like they're doing this uh, as a way of being like out in the open while at the same time having what was seen as sort of like deviant life. Yes, that's the word I'm looking for from their from their perspective, of course, not mine. <laughs> Yeah, which is weird because then, like, the main character we're seeing it all through is Hollis Mason, who doesn't seem to have any of those, at least as far as we can tell. It's never addressed in his memoirs, and we never really see anything like that. I guess it's possible he might have something going on that we just don't really see. Like, he seems to be a bachelor his entire life, but there's nothing else, like, for him aside from... Uh, he was a cop, which I guess is, like, his own kind of deviant lifestyle. But yeah, Hood of Justice is, like, clearly people know more about him, and we're not seeing it, but we don't see it. But he's so important that he kind of just stands out in a weird way, you know, unlike, say, the silhouette or uh, Mothman. Like those are like we know stuff about them, but they existed, but they're not super important to the like the story at, at large. But weirdly, Hooded Justice is very important because he's the reason why so many of these people get their start by the time that we get to the point in the 80s. But again, he's just like this mystery. Yeah, I mean, there's something very idyllically simplistic about hooded justice, right? She's like, I don't know. I'm going to put on a mask and stop some criminals from criming. That's as simple as it gets. Right. And it evolves into this, like, well, what if I, you know, what if I could reshape the world stuff and how far outside the law do I want to operate? It's a perfect like point of origin for this world of, of hooded vigilantes. Yeah. And it's fun. There's an implication that he might be killed by the comedian. After the fact. Yeah. Did they ever confirm that? Uh, no, nothing's ever confirmed. Like it, it, which allows it for it to be open for later theories and, and spinoff material. I was, I was really curious about that. Cause I was like, all right, cool. It's kind of like halfway, maybe implied that it could have happened possibly. <laughs> yeah. What's fun about Watchmen in general is that like, there's a lot of stuff that they like to hint at without actually confirming. Yeah. But yeah. So like, aside from him having this like big looming presence as a result of just his role, like he's such a mystery that we don't really have more to say about him, at least in the context of the of the comic itself. So let's move on to the last one I wanted to bring up just in terms of like characters who I feel like kind of have Superman like stuff going on with them. And this one's mostly aesthetic. But I wanted to mention Dollar Bill, who's also from the 40s era team. This is the character who in the comic establishes the whole like don't wear fucking capes rule like the Edna from uh, the Incredibles like no capes (laughs) (laughs) situation so costume wise he looks like a fucking Superman character he's in a blue spandex suit with red (laughs) with a red cape and red underwear and he's got a giant fucking S on his chest and he's like a jock from Kansas who was hired by a bank to be like yeah I'm I'm the hero who works for the bank yeah (laughs) and then when he tried to actually stop a robbery his cape got caught in the spinning door and uh, they shot him and that's it. <laughs> like, <laughs> apparently he was a nice guy. <laughs> I like that he's a corporate sponsored hero. Right. Right. Like that, that kind of is a nice flavor, you know, a different type of character to add to this. Like, well, of course, like if, if it was a popular trend, then some business would want to get in on it and have their like mascot be an actual hero. But you're also putting this dude in harm's way. Like this is not a guy who got into this because he was you know, driven by the murder of his parents or whatever. Like this is a, this is just a, <laughs> you know, a guy who probably just took a gig. Right. Exactly. And that's, I, I find kind of a fun element there. It's, this is the, the version where it's the most sanitized aspect of it all, where it's like, if you think of like the arc of comic superheroes of being like, well, I've got dark reasons for doing it to the point of just like, well, I just felt like being a superhero, which is like, what a lot of like the later golden age characters were, or when you get into like some of the silver age material where it just isn't as well thought out where like it's surface level, like, well, we needed to have a superhero because we needed to sell a comic book. And that kind of feels like what dollar bill is. You know, he's a nice guy from Kansas who is in good shape and there was money to be made. So he took this gig and got shot in the face as a result. Yeah. I mean, (laughs) that's kind of all you get of him, but that's all you need. Like he's just there. He's basically there to be a punchline. And and kind of move on. But like it informs this like sense of like, yeah, it sounds really fun to like put on a costume and go do this. But actually, in reality, like, yeah, it's ugly and like you're <laughs> just going to get shot most likely. Yeah. Like it, it's all gonna, you're all just going to get down in the dirt and that'll be it. Yeah. But I wanted to bring him up here because he looks the part. I mean, all of these characters are ones that I've done videos on for the Superman analog series, like dollar bill, like just, he looks like goddamn Superman. Like, and so there's this element there of like, that's gotta be an intentional thing. There's no real compromise aside from it being like 
money signs instead of anything else, which, you know, I know Alan Moore's a big fan of Super Duper Man and like Captain Marvel's <laughs> had like stuff going on like that in his. It, it's a Mad Magazine parody of Superman stuff. So I have to imagine that like there's stuff going on with all that where it's like, well, yeah, we're, we're just going to like have a character that like looks the part and like, you know, talks the talk and just point out that like that's not really going to do anything here. And that's not what the story is for. And like this world doesn't have a place for someone like that. Not a world this dark and cynical, no. no. <laughs> it's it's a dark and cynical world that is trying to look at, at like what comics had been and what what comics had taken for granted and sort of deconstruct them all and present a new way of approaching this kind of material. That is what is genre defining and genre busting about this thing, right? Like like the the it doesn't have the traditional happy ending that you're looking for, right? It's it's more about this rumination that Alan Moore wants us to to go on about power and how it's used or misused. Yeah. And then it doesn't necessarily have a happy ending. It it just is, it's a rumination on these things. Well, like you said, bad guy wins, but not, not only that does bad guy win, you know, he does the, the, the wonderful thing. He does this huge villain monologue <laughs> then lets you know, by the way, uh, I wouldn't, do you think I'd really be doing this monologue if there was any chance you could affect the outcome? I actually already triggered the thing 30 minutes ago. Yeah. Like, great moment. <laughs> right. Wonderful use of all the different clocks in that sequence to sort of remind you that, like, no, you have to pay attention to a lot of details. <laughs> so love his his that 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 sprawl of him saying, I did it. So his hands in the air, like, yes, I'm amazing. I did it. <laughs> Sounds like well, it's very like if Lex Luthor would have been in this universe, that would have probably been his moment right there. Yeah, I mean, there's certainly that kind of a vibe with with some of these characters that where they they could have been the villains in any other story, but <laughs> but I guess they're the heroes here. Yeah, they're not heroes in norm in much of the normal sense of what a hero is, right? They they are they are just exercising power the way they see fit and what they think is the correct morality, right? We are subject to whatever decisions they make. Again, who watches the Watchmen, right? They 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 make all of these decisions about how the world should be and how who's right, who's wrong, who should be brought to quote unquote justice and who not. The story doesn't do much to look at the lives of the people they affect other than, you know, the mass slaughter at the end. A thing that happens because they weren't being checked sufficiently outside. Yeah, I mean, like you bring up the the phrase quis custodia ipsos custodium that is the driving concept for like it's called Watchmen. That is, I think, an important element that we should spend a little bit of time talking about, which is that like this is a book that is about asking where the checks are in all of this power. Like when you have characters like Dr. Manhattan or like Ozymandias who have vast political and financial power or superpowers, why have we always in comics taken for granted that they're right? With Spider-Man, for example, having J. Jonah Jameson, he's made to be a bad guy in the press. But like that's kind of an anomaly. Like that's a like that's a thing for Spider-Man. But it's not like prior to the series coming out, like most superheroes were kind of just like the superheroes. Like they're the main character of their respective books. They're probably doing what's right, or at least they're doing as, as good as the, they think is right. And it all mostly works out in the end. And this is a series being like, well, what, what if they, they are not doing as good as a job as that they could be doing. And what if maybe if someone had been like looking over their shoulders and like, you know, correcting their work, they could have been better or more effective or anything. What if they're just not that helpful to society? <laughs> Yeah, there's not a whole lot they make better, at least, you know, long term. I mean, in the short term, they might stop a crime here or there. But, yeah, largely they are making the fabric of the world worse. And you talk about, like, oh, well, what about a check on them? And it's like what we what limited stuff we get about the cops and like actual government. Not much better. You know, this is it. Like I said, it's a, such a cynical work that it's like, well, anybody with any modicum of power is shown to be either flat out abusing it or at least misusing it, squandering it, not using their power correctly for the betterment of everyone. Yeah. And I mean, like this is a world that like tries to put checks on it. Like Dr. Manhattan is mostly overseen by the government. Vigilantism is outlawed. And so most of the people retire. Like those are all things that are put into the system to like pretend that there's some kind of restrictions, but ultimately these characters operating in a space sort of in an unchecked degree creates a, just a, a worse world for them all. 
it's interesting because I don't think there are that many comics prior to this point that had ever been like, well, is this actually good? And this is making a very strong statement of probably not. And it's not Alan Moore's like overall thesis of what, you know, is going on with, with comic characters. Like he has written plenty of things that show like the, the value of it. But this is one where it's like, well, if you take a normal person who has all of these flaws, like all the stuff, and you <laughs> you put them in this in this world and try to have like superhero kind of stuff. They're probably not going to just like take to it very well. Like I, I would fuck up pretty badly if I tried to be a superhero. Like I'm not trying to be mean, but like Doug, J. Mike, like I don't think you'd be very good superheroes because like being a superhero is like not really a thing that. <laughs> whoa, 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 whoa. Like you might be right, but don't say that loud. <laughs> like because we're all just flawed humans. That's the thing where like the world is not full of these like mythically good people. And these characters, even the ones who are godlike in in their powers, are still limited, potentially getting angry, potentially turning into hydrogen bombs with a penis. Uh, (laughs) (laughs) They're characters who can be manipulated and can be directed into ways that are not helpful. Like just a normal person given any kind of power is going to have to really regulate themselves to not misuse it. And also that the people who voluntarily choose to get into this line of work, you know, you have to wonder about the psyche of a person who says, I want to put on a this outfit and go punch people in the face. You're not starting from usually a paragon of justice. Yeah. I mean, like, look at the comedian. Like, right. He's he's a sadist. He's there to hurt people because he enjoys it. Like the, the textbook definition of a sadist. It gives him license to hurt people. I can, you know, I can say I'm doing this for the greater good because the people I'm hurting are are bad guys, but... He ultimately doesn't care about that. He's happy to go to Vietnam to just kill indiscriminately, right? He's happy to just put down a riot by just beating up whoever. And to him, of course, it's all a joke because we live in a society and yada, yada, yada. <laughs> but that is that is who he is. I mean, he is, you know, as much as he's an analog to the Charleston character is like pretty obvious analogy to the Joker here. And it's interesting because now the comedian has now reshaped how Peacemaker has been perceived like we wouldn't get like the James Gunn TV show if it wasn't for the comedian, because that sort of allowed the the character to get taken to that sort of like galvanized state of being. Why don't we move on to adaptations? Again, this is a comic where we could spend full podcast episodes talking about each and every issue. Um, So (laughs) there's the movie, which we've talked about a little bit. I have mixed feelings about it in general, but I think that it's a valiant effort. (laughs) <laughs> like Doug, so talking about the ending for for the movie, for the movie itself, I agree that it makes sense to like have it just be Dr. Manhattan. Like if you're going to try to do one three to five hour length movie because there's like different cuts of the movie, there's the one that includes all the Black Freighter animated sequences. But to have that like, yeah, like don't don't introduce the fucking squid thing, because I think that's that's way too complicated to throw in like that massive thing. I think it works a little bit better in the comic <laughs> to have the squid because one, it's 12 issues and for another it's comics. And so like that kind of stuff is like a little bit more uh, a thing you can just like observe. <laughs> but I completely agree that like in terms of like economy of storytelling, having it be Dr. Manhattan makes perfect sense. The counterpoint on that one is I think that having it be an outside thing that isn't like an American superhuman is sort of what, why it's like, oh, well, we have to put our guns down because there's like a bigger threat coming from outside. So I I see both sides as being viable reasons for using one or the other one there. I don't think it ruins the movie. I don't think it's a a problem with the movie, even though people like to bring it up a lot, because, again, like you only have so much (laughs) you only have so much space when you're when you're doing a a movie versus a 12 issue comic book series. (laughs) Like you can't you can't cover every detail the same way. The areas where I have trouble with the movie, because like I like I overall like the designs for the characters. I think that Ozymandias is, is telegraphed as being a bad guy too much. Yeah, I would agree with that. And I think the action sequences are too Snydery, which is like it's just like which is <laughs> like it's what he was doing, but like it's just that like the like they're doing like look at how cool we can make these like superhero action sequences whereas the comics are is more like well here's these very mundane people having these like kind of slow brutal fights and it's like kind of a bummer that we're doing like the ramp up like you know speed up slow down kind of stuff in there they're like doing these these big like physical motions but then there's like so many parts of it that are like almost perfect like the Dr. Manhattan uh, on Mars stuff is like pitch perfect 
his origin, you know, the, the, where they dramatize that jumping back and forth through time with that Philip Glass music behind it is Chef's Kiss. I think they, they absolutely nailed that part. And they had, it's like the most compelling part of the movie for me. Like just watching that sequence is just, it's incredible. Yeah. The times they are a changing montage is so fucking good. Like oh, in terms man, of like getting yeah. the history of this world. I mean, something that takes like, you know, just dozens upon dozens of pages and like Hollis Mason's, you know, biography to like get all this information across. They do it just with a montage. It's like it's up there with like the beginning of Up as like, can you make a little short film within your film that accomplishes so much? Like it it is masterful, that piece. Yeah. So great stuff going on there. I think that generally the casting is really solid. Jackie Hurl Haley as uh, Rorschach is a fantastic choice right there. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I think Rorschach has led to be like a little bit more heroic, but he, it's also kind of just movie language. And we kind of just a lot of people like Rorschach from the comics also. And it's like, you know, you're not spending enough time like really like dwelling on that. Billy Crudup as as Osterman, I think is perfect. Malin Ackerman, I think, is too young for Silk Spectre in that. She's supposed to be like in her 40s or like late 30s. <laughs> She's like late 20s, early 30s, like a little too ingenue at this point. And like I said, I think that Ozymandias is just like a little too telegraphed as being like, yeah, no, he's the bad guy. <laughs> but aside from that, like I mean, telegraph is a bad guy. I mean, it's supposed to be a twist that Ozymandias is actually, you know, the villain. But you're right. I mean, his presentation, the way he's so cold and like there's no one else to be the villain that they give you. Like they don't give you any like red herrings or anything like that. And it's just like, yep, uh, the most evil looking guy is, in fact, the evil guy. Yeah. The guy with like the slightly German <laughs> accent and his superhero outfit is like all black in the movie instead of being like mostly gold with like purple highlights. Like it's, it's just a weird element there. <laughs> I like that they put the Joel Schumacher bat nipples on it. I thought that was really funny. I actually like a lot of those parts there. Cause I, yeah. I think that that makes sense in terms of like, uh, we're going to do like, we're going to do superhero movie stuff instead of superhero comic stuff. Right. Likewise with like night owls outfit looks like a, you know, like, in, like any of the Tim Burton Batman stuff. Well, which is obviously his closest analog for sure. I think, yeah, Jeffrey Dean Morgan is perfect. I like Carla Gugino or Jugino, however you say her name, as the uh, elder Silk Spectre. I think she's, yeah. she's a good choice for that. She's yeah. a, honestly, she should have been Silk Spectre too. Like she's the perfect age and she's just such a strong actress. Like she would have been fantastic for the part. Yeah, I, I didn't have a problem with Malin Ackerman. Um, I think she does a lot because I think her version of that character is a little more three dimensional than she is in the book. I think she's a little more of like, you know, we're not not the first people to know that Alan Moore has problems writing women. Um, so, you know, she needs to be she, she is the heart of the story. She has to be because she's the one who brings John literally back to Earth. It's her and Dan's story that, again, is like the happy note to go out on if there is one. So I like her bringing that to the role. But Billy Crudup is like, I love how like kind of counterintuitive he is as a choice for this because like his voice is so kind of soft. Like you, you, when you read Dr. Manhattan, you picture this like booming, powerful figure and like he doesn't sound like that. He's actually very soft spoken, which I think makes it an even more interesting thing to watch. Yeah. Oh, there is. A, so one other thing that I do have issues with with the movie is the fact that they tease that it's comedians actually Silk Spectre's dad earlier in the movie when there's like the, the touch and sort of like memory flash thing. That was like, oh, that's also supposed to be a twist later on. <laughs> like a lot of the twists are telegraphed a little on the early side for my tastes in that movie. But aside from that, like it's a monumental project in terms of getting as much in there. And they have so many things that are either nearly shot for shot or like play out pretty much exactly as it happened in the comics. It's an impressive work just from the standpoint that it had long been considered unfilmable. As, yeah, as an adaptation mm-hmm. of something that's very, very hard to adapt. Fairly impressive. I also wanted to shout out the, the musical cues. Uh, we kind of talked about it a little bit, but you know, some of them are, are taken straight out of the, the comic. So good on them for going like, okay, we got to get all along the Watchtower because here's where it's actually in the comic. Um, like some of those things. So obviously they work because they worked for Alan Moore, but like this, you know, very, um, you know, classic rock sort of sound that they use for it. All of those needle drops are just dead on perfect, with the exception of maybe Hallelujah is a little much. <laughs> yeah, which is just a that, that's a staple of Zack Snyder works. <laughs> <laughs> He's choosing another yeah. song. Like I don't okay. I don't want to hate too much on because like I, I actually really liked it when it came out. I, I still like it overall as an adaptation. I uh, I think that it was just it, it's such a huge work and that it's hard to like fully hit. And it was it was going to be impossible for it to be the right movie for everyone. Yeah. It was a big challenge. I think it was a really, like I said, a really valiant effort. 
that nails a lot of the stuff that I wanted to see really well. But it's also just a huge, huge ass movie that has, like I said, multiple edits, including one that has the, the animated sequences and oh, right. all, all that stuff. So, mm-hmm. and it brought a lot of people into Watchmen as a, as a thing and into reading the comic and made a lot more popularity out there. It also had a spin off video game, which I've never played. I've wanted to. And it's like set during like the 70s riots where that like led to the outlawing of vigilantes. Doug, you said you, you played a demo of it. There was a demo that was released. Yeah. I mean, contemporaneously. I, I, well, this was not something I played recently. And it's basically a beat em up. Um, I just remember it feeling kind of boring. And also it's like it's one of those things where like, I mean, we're, we will touch on the TV show, which I've not seen um, in the, the HBO show. But it's like they, they've now put out a lot of comics that are now spin off trying to like add to this world. And I kind I don't want to say I'm against all of it, but there's a sense of like when you read this thing or when you watch the movie, like this is a singular story. Like it has a nice beginning, a middle and an end because this whole thing is essentially a philosophical rumination. Like it's a complete thought. So it doesn't lend itself to being, having stuff grafted onto it this way. It tends to muddy the waters a lot. So um, yeah, certainly the little like mediocre story of the game didn't really add anything in terms of like flushing out the world or uh, from the part that I saw. And so, yeah, I'm, I, I was very skeptical of the HBO show, which I, I never saw. Uh, and I haven't read any of that supplementary material. I generally have the same viewpoint, which is that this was a, a complete work. I don't really need to see sequel material with with the same characters or anything like that. And I I, I didn't really like that they did the before Watchmen comics around when the movie came out. I've looked at little bits of it, but I haven't really read too much of it. I've heard like the Darwin Cook stuff was like fine. You know, like there's like some stuff that's like well done in that group. But overall, it was like, is this really additive? Not really. Like it kind of like it doesn't make your experience that much better. I have heard that the Tom King series that has come out more recently, the Rorschach comic that has, has come out is a pretty interesting one. Likewise, it's just like I have a hard time like looking at that material. Like it just doesn't feel like it could possibly be that interesting or really like make the experience better considering like I think that the the comic is like such a perfect standalone like thing and I will say the show like we talked about it when it first came out blew me away in terms of being actually interesting it also doesn't really have anything to do with the original comic it's like a completely separate story just set in the same universe and set 30 years later for me it it works a lot better as a result. There are some shared characters, but it's 30 years later. So like minor spoiler, Silk Spectre 2 shows up and she's played by Jean Smart. And, you know, she's a much older woman as a result <laughs> of it all. So like the, the way that things play out for those characters are it's been a long time. Most many of them are either dead or, or old or we don't see. And like the, the world is just very different. The majority of the players are new ones. And that's fine. Like, I, I, I was really impressed with it. I, I thought they did a lot of really good stuff with it. And it, like, had new conversations about it that worked for the medium in question. Like, it worked really well as a TV show. I don't think it would have worked well as a comic book that I thought was really interesting and was different enough that I was like, OK, this is a valiant effort that, like, might kind of recontextualize some of the stuff from the comic, but, like, is its own sort of standalone thing and works fine. And I think it's worth checking out. Like, if you if you like Watchmen, I think it's it's very much worth watching. But it doesn't make the comic better or worse. It's it's just its own separate thing. And since it's HBO, is there a greater quantity of Doctor Manhattan penis? Than the movie? <laughs> Less than the movie. <laughs> it, um, so Manhattan does show up in it, but he's not a big player for the majority of the of it. Like, it's more the lasting impact of Manhattan on the world <laughs> is, is how it plays out. And I don't want to give too many spoilers away because it's just it's more recent and it's worth checking out. It does not revel in nudity. I will say that. <laughs> so not the same producers as like, say, Game of Thrones. They're, they're not. It's HBO. We can put all the penis we want. All right. No, no, <laughs> there, there's no sex position in that. <laughs> all right. Again, I, I think it's an interesting piece that's that is actually building on this world of like, oh, yeah, well, vigilantes have been around. And so like how they how that works with like law and order and stuff is, is kind of cool. It's this world where like the tease at the end of the book where Robert Redford is going to become president, like becomes an aspect of how when you're looking at American politics, like how things have changed by virtue of like, well, instead of Ronald Reagan and like the, this big right wing movement, it's, it's like this left wing movement that happens and like different things that sort of play out as a result. So it, it's a cool alternate universe kind of story that I think at least was having a similar spirit in terms of like, we're going to really think out the ramifications and how we're going to do all the all this stuff. And for me, it's a worthwhile follow up that, like I said, doesn't really 
do much to my appreciation of the comic either way. There have been spinoff materials that have made me like less enthusiastic about a source material. You know, how many movies have been out there where like having bad sequels have kind of made the original harder to like really love the same way? Like there's like the Jaws or the like your Highlanders where like somehow having terrible sequels, Mm -hmm. you still love the originals. But then you look at like the Planet of the Apes movies and like the first one's great. But like for a while, like that original five block was like had become kind of a joke because it got so weird uh, by the end (laughs) of it all. So this at least is like it's pretty different. It's like clearly different people. It's it's worth checking out. (laughs) (laughs) I will file that away as something to check out when I get around to it. I've been I've been reluctant to, but I'm, I'm willing to give it a shot. But yeah, so I think that kind of wraps up our, like the discussion we wanted to have on Watchmen. We did, you know, like I said, there's so much we could talk about. Like I've got the annotated version o- open right now and it's just like page after page of notes on every panel that's in this comic. Like there's so much cool stuff in it. I mentioned Dave Gibbons at the beginning, but like Dave Gibbons is such a detailed artist. Like the way that like John Osterman and Janie's hands touch each other when they give the beer that is this like symbol that they keep bringing back in like Osterman's mind of like this one perfect moment of this human connection with this woman that he at the time loved. And eventually he'd like cheat on her and like she'd leave and like all this stuff. But like how like that one moment with this like cold beer where you can see like the bubbles and the way it fizzes. That's so much fucking detail there. We haven't talked about like the nine panel grid. There's just so much fucking stuff to talk about. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot. It's very, very dense. Yeah, series. There's, it's it's a huge work that had a lot of thought put into it and had a lot of like mastery of craft in terms of what you can do with a comic at the time. And obviously technology has changed. The software that people use for drawing has changed in a lot of ways. Your ability to have additional material and supplemental material, your ability to color, to do all, all the cre- the creative elements of putting this together is a different world than it was when this came out. But in terms of like the technological and artistic levels that comic books had ascended to by the time we get got to 1985, this is the mastery of that. Like, this is like, <laughs> like, it's perfect. Not in the sense that it's like, n- like necessarily the most fun comic. Like, it's not my favorite Alan Moore comic from the standpoint of like, is it the most energetic or the one that gives me the most feels? But in terms of like clearly seeing the mastery of craft, I don't think you can get much better than this. The reason people keep coming back to this thing is like, well, what's the greatest comic ever created, right? Like, th- th- this will always be near the, at or near the top of the list is because it is, you know, kind of sinking three pointers on all of these things. Like it's, it is the technical mastery of the images themselves um, and the way they're, they're all they're composed and put together. It's the ambition of the, you know, the, the level of what they want to tell a story about and how it is not just an interesting story about power and control and, and all of those themes, right? The, the theme of time and clockwork and watches and police authority, all of that stuff is then also folded back into this commentary on comic books themselves. It's doing so many things and doing all of them well. And within that, the characters are interesting as standalone people. It's hard to imagine another book coming along and doing this, especially when you consider that these are all original characters, right? You're not banking on like, well, everybody loves Batman. These are characters that nobody knows. And like, they're all self-contained within this single expression of an idea. And it's just so powerful on all of those different fronts. It's just a, it's a masterwork for a reason. Yeah. An incredible piece. And like I said, there's just there's so much that we can talk about. And like we're trying to like keep this like kind of into a a discussion of like how this impacted comics and how this worked with like the Superman archetype. But like there's again, like so much more we could we could say, Doug, thank you for bringing this. Oh, sure. My pleasure. (laughs) It's been one that we always knew we were going to talk about at some (laughs) point, but but it was one that we were like, "Eh, I don't I wasn't like chomping at the bit to like. (laughs) <laughs> try try to keep this condensed <laughs> to a single episode. So. It's a spicy meatball, <laughs> it's just, yeah. It's daunting. That's that's what I'm trying to say. And I, I'm glad that we had a chance to talk about it. To somehow, just somehow, get it under two hours in an episode. Fuck yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we wrestled this thing to the ground somehow. Yeah. So, Doug, again, thank you for, for bringing this on. Thank you for coming on. I'm really glad that we've connected, that I've been on your show, and that you've been also over on Another Pass. But... For people who want to hear more of uh, you and for your stuff, give your plugs, like, t- you know, ex- explain your show again, say where people can find you, g- give all of that. 
Sure. So uh, the show is called Nostalgium Arcanum. Uh, I know I made it easy to remember and spell. It, it is ultimately, it's a, a repository of pop culture stuff. So uh, there's episodes on all kinds of topics ranging from movies, TV shows, video games, comics, comic strips, toys, really, really just about anything you that, that you might be into. If you're into comic book stuff, I'm trying to think of episodes we've done that would be kind of in this vein. So we did do a uh, case was obviously on to talk about Calvin and Hobbes, which is awesome. We did one on Superman, the movie. I have one recorded on Tim Burton's Batman. Um, there's, uh, there's plenty of others that we've got like 50, 60 episodes by the time you hear this. So there's going to be something you like in there that fits your mold. If you want to find us on the socials, um, we are at nostalgium pod on the graveyard, formerly known as Twitter. We are also at nostalgium pod on blue sky <laughs> and then nostalgium arcanum on threads and Instagram. And I do post bonus stuff on Instagram. So if you're going to follow it, if, you're gonna, if you have to pick one, and of course you don't, cause they're all free. Um, but that's where I put all the bonus stuff is on Instagram. So. Um, but that's the show in a nutshell. And um, if, if you liked hearing anything I had to say and you need to hear more of my voice, that's where you find it. Well, everyone should check that out. As we mentioned a couple of times, I was on not too long ago. Our uh, former editor, Matt Storm, was also on more than once now, right? Yeah, he did. Uh, he came on to talk about Chrono Trigger and then he was on more recently to do one on uh, the uh, Queen. Yeah. So obviously go check all that out. We love Matt. Even though they abandoned us because they were too busy. <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, it's it's a great show. And like, you know, definitely you find an episode of Nostalgia Marcanum that's on a, a topic that you love. And uh, it, it's just so fun to like hear people talk about like why it meant something to them too. Like that shared love of the of all these various like nerd topics is is such a great part about the modern era, like the internet allowing people to really share the things that they're passionate about and to find their fellow freaks, you know, that's such a cool thing that like we finally got to after living in the shadows for so long as like as the nerds. <laughs> uh, that's what the show is. Ultimately, it's a, you know, it's a safe space for you to come and geek out about whatever that thing is for you. It ended up becoming that. And I'm, I'm really kind of gratified because it makes the experience it may, of doing the show really fun to just have someone come on and be like, oh, man, I love this thing so much. That positive energy is always just uh, it's nice to record, you know, just hang out with somebody and hear them share that. Yeah. So everyone should go check all that out. J. Mike, where can people find you, follow you? What have you got going on right now? On Twitter at J. Mike 101. I will eventually get the Blue Sky uh, page up and running occasionally, maybe one day. But yeah, find me at both those places. Reach out, talk. I'm always willing to chit chat with everybody. Yeah. We got to keep on prodding J. Mike into being as, as active a social media person as he can be <laughs> since, uh, <laughs> especially with the hell site uh, falling apart. Like the strong gift game of, of J. Mike Falson is, is uh, yet to find a new, uh, a, a new place to call home. <laughs> I do. Hopefully Blue Sky adds gifts soon because like, currently it's like, I keep wanting to respond to people that way. <laughs> On that note, you can find me on Blue Sky at K Sagan. You can find me on the hell side of Twitter at K Sagan. Mo most places you can find me at, at K Sagan. Instagram at Quetzalcoatl5 because I am holding on to that damn AIM screen name for dear life. And you can find the show on Twitter at Men of Steel or more. Uh, the best place to find it is at certainpov.com where you can find more episodes of this show. Tons of other great shows. We we mentioned Matt before, so I'm going to throw out a, a, an older callback, which is uh, CPOV autographs. It's currently on hiatus, but Matt recorded so many wonderful interviews with so many awesome guests that you should check those out because th there's so many creatives that like were able to really share their stories on there. So check out that series. It's, you can find every episode at certainpov.com. You can also find a link to our Discord server at certainpov.com where you can come interact with all of us. We're all on there. It's uh, it's a great time. Lots of conversations about music, about art, about Baldur's Gate 3, so much so that we had to create its own separate section because, wow, that game has invaded the zeitgeist. <laughs> so check all that out and, the, you know, come back, listen to the next episode. But until then, stay super, man. Men of Steel is a certain POV production. Our hosts are J. Mike Folson and Case Aiken. The show is scored and edited by Jeff Moonen. And our logo and episode art is by Case Aiken. Video games are a unique medium. They can tell stories. Immerse us in strange, fantastic worlds. Blur the very boundaries of our reality. But at the end of the day, video games are fun. Whatever fun is to you. 
I'm Jeff Moonen. And I am Matt A.K. Stormageddon. And on Fun and Games, we talk about the history, trends, and community of video games. It's a celebration of all the games we play and all the fun we find within them. And there's so many more games out there. So we hope you'll share in that conversation with us. Fun and Games podcast with Matt and Jeff. Find us on certainpov.com or wherever you get your podcasts. And happy gaming. It's October 29th, 2023, and I'm talking about nerd shit again. <laughs> uh, CPOV. CertainPOV.com.